Hi there. I'm Tim Rogers, Chief Scruff of the rock band UMI. Tonight's Australian story is about a friend and a colleague of mine who rather tellingly as a band manager took the rock band Jet from obscurity to international stardom. However, recently he's been on a personal journey that's been equal parts horrifying and truly inspiring. This is David Powell's story. David Powell? Yes. I don't dare to hope because he's going in for another surgery and that churns up all of the once bitten sort of feelings. They're not minor surgeries, but they shouldn't be life threatening. But to me, everyone is. I'm actually really, really happy for once, I suppose, to go actually under the knife for Touchwood um, the last time. There you go. Oh, I remember the last time when you had your toes off. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, beautiful. Lovely. I'm all ready for Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. <laughs> There's part of me that is very fearful. David now is, is chronically ill. That's his status. We're meant to be together. And I know this is a strange time in our relationship now. No matter what state Dave is in, I love him. Oh, David was a sweetie. He loved anything to do with soldiery and uh, pilots. He was going to be a pilot, you see. That's all I really ever wanted to do. But unfortunately, David had a problem, an ear infection, that started, must have been when he was a babe or something, caught an infection. That kind of meant that I was never going to be a, a fighter pilot. The thing is that I went through high school doing that's A, B, Fizz and Chem in the idea of getting into the Royal Australian Air Force and it was never going to happen because I was never going to pass the physical. When we were teenagers, Dave and I decided to join a band together. He had a very, very strong work ethic. It was all about being as, you know, as good as, as could be and, uh, and he used to drive me crazy. Yeah. Well, he would have jobs that relate somehow to music. Then he ended up at the Duke of Windsor and he's working on the bar there. And that's where the rock bands used to meet. The first time I met Dave was really saw Dave. He was playing at the Duke of Windsor in a reggae beret with these big side bands and, and uh, long hair at the time. And I thought he was just, he was an amazing guitarist. I thought he was, yeah, good looking. I shouldn't say weaseling, but I kind of like got myself into her band. That obviously caused a certain dynamic, but there was, she played bass. You know, I was very much going, I think, I think you could be a star. When Dave joined my band, I knew it was the beginning of the end of the relationship I was in. He said, that's it, She's, um, she is the one. And that's, that's fine, I will marry her. And he'd never said that before. In 2002, the Duke of Windsor became one of Melbourne's main venues. They had a lot of new bands come through and a scene started there. And one of the bands that stood out at the time were Jet. The first that I'd heard of Jet, they weren't Jet. They actually didn't have a name. And we've just gone, what? They don't have a name? How on together is this band? Just, he's just so confident, Dave, you know, that, that you think that you've done something wrong when he's talking to you almost. They gave me a demo by this stage and I've gone, I love it, it's great, but you've got to have a name. And they came back and they said, Jet, what do you reckon? I said, perfect. Fantastic, I love it. I love it, Jet. It's small, 
just a small word, it can blow up big, it's great, I love it. So we just sort of always kept aiming for the next, what's next, what's next, what's next? So at that point, what's next was getting a manager. And that's where Dave came into our lives. Dave was in our band, he was in his own band, Valve, and then all of a sudden we heard of Jet. And he started booking them at the, the Duke, bumping other bands off to get them on the right playing time and the right, so we realised he had something going on. The Duke of Windsor became our headquarters. Dave would be taking calls from, you know, executives in Los Angeles from the keg room, you know? That was his office. <laughs> when every major label in the world, bar one, is interested in your band, you're gonna get the best deal possible. Dave, he always had a girl around. I remember in the first year, there was, there was probably like two or three girlfriends, easily. I didn't really get to know Leah that well for quite some time. It became this whirlwind with Jet, and the next thing really was, for me, Dave was going to LA. Oh, yeah. Straight this is Hollywood. Hollywood Boulevard. Yeah. At this beginning of 2003, Dave and Jet boarded planes for Los Angeles and recorded the Get Born album. That's Came in America, Mark in America. I'll see Me in America. Just crazy adventure after crazy adventure, and, and Dave was always in the middle of it, coordinating everything, you know. In a space of a month or two, he made a lot of stuff happen for Jet. I don't think they would be where they are today without Dave Powell. It was like being on school camp with, like, with a crazy guy. <laughs> I'll be taking a video today of uh, Jet starting their first album in LA. It's the first time we've actually plugged in. We're all ready to go. OK, let's see how the boys are. Hey, there's Nick on the first day of his recording for the album. Oh, you are there? Yeah. Oh. How you doing? The best ones are the crazy ones. He'd wake us up to go to the studio and he'd drive us down there and he would just basically do everything that uh, every manager after that never did, <laughs> basically. It was like a little family. It was like a family. Chris really really looked up to Dave and I guess Chris being the youngest member of our band as well. Chris always gravitates towards personality types like Dave, I guess is fair to say. I think my relationship with Dave was was um maybe maybe a bit deeper. Theirs was more fun. <laughs> and you are Jet, you're here from Australia, Melbourne. Right? All the way, yep, We're all the way. We're excited to have you here. And... All the stars yeah. aligned for Jet. They have sold over a million records their debut album, Get Born, has gone nine or ten times platinum. We'd done a co-management deal with Dave and another company called Winterman and Goldstein. Their international experience was something that, that we, we thought would be really handy for the band because Dave hadn't managed a band in America or in Britain and it's all really different, you know, the way things work is really different. So, first of all, that was, I think, the beginning, really, of the end of our relationship with Dave. It was pretty naive of us to assume that having two separate management companies was was the legitimate option that was gonna that was gonna last. They tried to work together and then gradually, you know, they were just telling us things that, you know, it was it was really difficult and they were finding it difficult to get through to him and get certain ideas through to him. And um, and they basically just sort of convinced us that it would work better if it was just them. I got a call from the band's lawyer saying that the band would like to meet up to talk over the management contract with me and my partner, my, um, my business partner at the time. And um, I had a s sinking suspicion that something was amiss. We talked about, we doing ab about the meeting and about telling Dave and stuff and, and I just, 
I just said it or I couldn't go. I've chickened out of a few things like that. You start playing in a band thinking nothing more than playing gigs and, and having fun and writing music and it's all a big sort of party and at one point you realise there's a lot more at stake here and it's, it could go away at any minute as well and, and this is a serious opportunity and something that we can't um, waste. And I said, look, it's OK. It's OK, Nick. I know what you're about to say and I'm absolutely fine with it. Typical of Dave, recognised how horrible I was finding having, you know, being charged with the duty of, and made it as easy for me as possible, you know. A testament to his, to him as a human being. David decided to not challenge the contract and walked away and wished them all the best. It really was the moment where the innocence of it all was lost, though. To be completely honest, I don't think it was ever that fun after that either. It was completely Dave's decision to do that. That's part of why I love David, is he's a genuinely really nice person. But he probably missed out on considerable income, future earnings from that first album. I'm not really sure whether Jet knew at the time what Dave gave up to manage them. The situation we're in now, I'm, I, you know, could keep you up at night if, if you let it. Dave was kind of left floating. There wasn't much going on in the industry that was going to give us a real wage at the end of the week, so uh, he took on a, an office job because he knew, you know, rent and baby coming and that's what he had to do. He wasn't too happy about telling people what he was doing. I think he looked at it as a bit of a failure, a big step backwards. She's a beautiful baby. <laughs> we know that. I kind of, like, separated myself from the rock industry or the music industry. The late nights, drinking, smoking, all of that stuff. Merry Christmas, Mama. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, son. We had, you know, our second child on her way, and it was now time I was just going, look, I've got to do a nine to five gig. So I was riding to work. I'd even done a, like a half marathon at one stage, so I was really, really fit. And then I got this kind of like these fevers. At the beginning of 2009, there was the fear, the epidemic of swine flu. We took Stella for a swimming lesson and because I'd not long given birth, Dave got in the water and, and he came out and he was shivering uncontrollably. And so I was going, oh, I don't feel good, I don't feel good. And I just do remember picking her up and taking her to the showers and like, and, and you know, going, geez, I'm really feeling dizzy. And I said, you know, I'm not taking the kids into an emergency room with all these bugs going around. I took a cab and they thought, oh look, it's just a it's just a flu, go home, take some Panadol. The following day, Monday, he started to uh, not be able to sleep. We went and saw the GP, we rang nurse on call. This time I said, look, my sister can come over and take me to emergency, so she did. And they took one look at us and said, listen, if it's swine flu, you've got to go down to the Heidelberg Swine Flu Clinic. Um, so we went back in the car, drove down. By the time uh, we got him into the clinic and as we're admitting him, the nurse said, hold on, he, he's going, and he, he collapsed in the clinic. And they immediately called uh, an ambulance. That was the uh, really the first intimation of the enormity of what was going to unfold, but we still didn't know. The atmosphere in emergency was pretty crazy. They're overworked, it's extremely busy. They were very fearful that it still was swine flu. And I sat there 